it's, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back Wayne May to teach us more. Thank you, Wayne. All right. Oh. All right. Um, what I have here tonight, it's not like a solid running presentation. Oh, thank you. I have pieces of information that have come my way and I've put together uh, during our almost 24-month housebound shutdown, well, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, so what I'm going to do is share this stuff with you, uh, a lot of it for the first time. There's, I think, one thing in here that maybe Amberly has seen, but otherwise it should be, should be pretty well new because it's, uh, it's just new stuff that's come my way. And uh, there's about three or four parts of it that are connected to like pharaohs, Jaredites, Adina, ancient Egypt, and I'll be putting together what's called a Jaredites 2 for my DVDs. And I'm going to share some of that stuff with you tonight. So uh, with that in mind, you can see my first slide up here. I've got down, uh, this is my first Book of Mormon. Now, <clears throat> I, oh, that's great. Thank you. I think uh, if I didn't know better, it was quite a while for the joke playing, but Heavenly Father played a good joke on me. Uh, right here, my first Book of Mormon. When I was in college, uh, University of Wisconsin, I uh, refinished furniture. I bought antiques uh, up north where I live, which is five hours. I, my school was in uh, the southern part of the state, five hours away. So I'd come down with my antiques and I'd sell them down there. And I could, I could buy for one and sell for two, you know. And I made a pretty good buck at it. The very day that I got baptized in 1970, I ran to the missionary in 67, but in 1970 I got baptized. I had to really check you guys out, you know. <laughs> so uh, anyway... I got baptized on a Tuesday, uh, I drove home, this was in July, I got home Friday, Saturday morning I was out bright and early to an auction, because I, I was watching one come up, it looked pretty good. And I know the uh, auctioneer's name is Bunny Humple, and uh, <laughs> he's our auctioneer, and Bunny knows that I only want furniture, and of course what do they do to keep the crowd? They sell uh, the kitchenwares first, you know, the living room, the, you know, the, the junk and whatever. And of course, I'm in the back, I'm hollering at Benny, and Bunny said, Bunny, I'm going to leave if you don't sell some good stuff, you know. Yeah. Anyway, he knew I was back there, so he, he grabbed a box of books, and I was, I'm going I'm to tell you, I was, I was longer in this room away, maybe this room and a half again. He holds up this box of books, and he said, okay, uh, let's just start it off. He'll give me $10. Well, no, nothing. Probably someone says a buck, and then we're up to two, and then the three. My eyes focused on that box. And this is what I saw. Hmm. Well, an antique book of and all of a sudden, I'm raising my hand. Bunny's saying, uh, Wayne, are you, uh, this is not furniture. Uh, Bunny, I want, I want that book. So <laughs> he, he just cut it off at six bucks. I got the box. I go up. I pull this out of the box. And I hear, sell them again. You know, <laughs> this, I just want this book. <laughs> so uh, that was odd, but that's OK. So I open this thing up here. Here's the third Chicago edition. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but. The mission field at this time, this is like 1900, they were able to print their own Book of Mormons where they were. They didn't come from Salt Lake. They had their own printer house within the mission, and that's how they did it, and they took care of it. And then, uh, let's go here. Not working. There we go. Okay. You can see it's a 1907. Uh, all the references are done by Orson and Parley Pratt. Orson takes the credit here. Now you got to remember, I'm, an, I'm a new guy in the church. I'm still, I still got water behind my ears. I'm getting dunked a few days ago, okay? And look at this here. Ancient inhabitants were destroyed by the hand of the Lord upon the face of this north country. Look at the reference. North America. North America. Well, that was confusing. I thought it was in Central America. Well, I, whatever. <laughs> it must be a goofy book, right? So let's press on. This thing is, uh, I think I may have to use this down here. Wait, there. did you track down what? who determined it was North America? Pardon? No? Did you determine who? Well, it's Orson and Parley. It's, they're responsible for the footnotes. Nice. Orson and Parley. And then this one here, you know, and their bones should become as heaps upon the face, uh, upon the face of the earth, of the land. And look at the arrow, the ancient mounds of... North America. It doesn't say Central America. It doesn't say South America. You know, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm really tripping out reading this book, you know. What was the copyright on this? 
1907. 1907. And the, here is, and the waters of Ripley Ancom, supposed to be Lake Ontario. Wow. The hill Rama, Rama was the hill Camorra. Wow. Wasn't that awesome? Wow. Now, what's really crazy, you see, I sat on this book for 18 years. Remember the day I told you when I woke up? This was in my house for 18 years, and I just put it aside because it didn't make any sense. Because where's the Book of Mormon? It's in Central America. I didn't care. I, I wasn't converted to the gospel by archaeology. It was the Book of Mormon. But this, this was very confusing. So, anyway, I showed you this today. It's the same thing. But I want to go to this right here. This is Jacob. And behold, this lass whose branch had withered away, green, look down to the green, 2F, Nephites. I did plant on a good spot of ground, purple, Okay, look down purple, America, and then 44. I also cut down that which covered the spot of ground, red. Red is Jaredites. And 45, and thou beholdest that a part thereof, blue, Nephites, brought forth good fruit, and a part thereof brought forth wild fruit, yellow, Lamanites. That's in Jacob, okay? And I'm going to pass by this. I showed this to you guys today. I'm not going to double it. I just, I had a lot of comments about Moroni's path. You know, in case you didn't catch it, where did Moroni have to go? Manti. So he had to swing to Utah first and then come back to New York. Okay? All right. Now, here's though, we're looking at Jacob. It's already telling us that they're in America. Okay? 55 years has passed. That's all. All right? And based on this, they're already in America at the promised land in just 55 years. So the point is, if they're landing down at the Isthmus of Darien, down in Argentina, this whole Nephite Lamanite event runs all the way up the entire Western Hemisphere into North America in just 55 years. Not going to happen, people. Not going to happen. Something's goofy. So that's just one little thing I found, okay? And then I just got a blank spot. Any comments on that before I go on to the next one? Comments? Not. <laughs> I don't know the exact year, near as I can tell, be 29 to 1930. That's when they were pulled. And uh, why they didn't go back in? Well, your guess is as good as mine. What can I say? Now this here, Amberly, have you seen this before? So who put oh. all those in? Orson and Parley did them, but they were church approved. Salt Lake approved. Orson Parley's footnotes went everywhere throughout the country. Yes? 29 was when they decided to throw the lectures on faith out of the doctrine. Well, see, that could have been a good there time. There might be a correlation there. Could very well be. Thanks for sharing that. I didn't know that. All right. Okay. Now, th th this is something I'm not going to tell you to change your thinking on. I just want you to be aware of what I'm going to show you. So this is like spo uh, food for thought. So I'm going to go ahead and advance this. Now, we... We're taught, and we, at least it's understood, that, uh, you know, who, who came to America first? Who did the church tell us? Who is this special man brought over by the Spirit? Columbus. Columbus. Okay. And then, of course, we go here, we talk about, you know, the pilgrims come to the Americas, and that's all cool, neat stuff. And we talk about the British, you know, Bunker Hill. It was their resolve to take it, no matter how many guys got blown away. It didn't matter. But that's okay, you know. The mother Gentiles were gathered together upon the waters against them. And, of course, here we have, Behold, that the Gentiles had gone out of captivity or delivered by the power of God. Well, Columbus might be the guy, but there's another guy to consider. There's Chris. Christopher's journal and diary, which still exists today, is totally a commercial adventure. He's out for bucks. He's looking for the Northwest Passage, right, to get to India. That's his mindset. But there's another guy who... If you read his diary, all he wanted to do was to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to whatever people lived on this new land. And his name was John Cabot. Interesting. Now, you might think this is splitting hairs, but I want you to know about the whole thing. This right here, you see Cabot takes off from England, sails right into uh, just up in Canada. You can see Columbus's route, and I'll do it a little better here. See Cabot's route in 1497. There's Columbus. Now, the white shaded area is where Columbus actually set foot. He never set foot into 
North America. Thank you very much. Interesting. But John Cavett did. The Algonquin okay? Nation. That's right. The Up and down the Algonquins. Just food for thought. I just I don't want to destroy Columbus for you guys. I just <laughs> I really don't care if that's okay. <laughs> what? I, I was going to say, um, I did some looking into this. Columbus was very bloodthirsty, tortured, murdered, loads and loads of natives. That's right. Um, he, was a, he was a dirty, brutal man. That's so, right. So, I don't think it was Columbus. <laughs> was Cabot a good guy? Yes, Cabot's diary. He was a man of God. Okay. He came here strictly to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Period. He wasn't here looking for bucks. He wasn't looking for Buck. So, again, here we go, you know, picture of the Lord coming out of captivity, protective. And then, just for sake, how many here are Scan have Scandinavian descent? I have to do what I call honorable mention. Because these guys were here, but the Lord flushed them out because they came too soon. Okay? And that's a whole other story. But I think it's cool, because they definitely were here. There's no doubt about it. Okay. Any comments before we go to the next one? All right. Where did the Jaredites cross? Anybody got an idea? It's in your scriptures. Surprise! <laughs> well, we all know about the Tower of Babel. Terrific story, okay? We're told that when they left Babel, because of Nimrod and all that good stuff, they go north. And when they go north, then it doesn't tell us, did they go west? Did they go east? We don't know. It, just, it doesn't say where they went. Most of our early academics have told us in the church that they went China direction. That's fair. Pacific. No big deal. So, Ether 1 and 42, when thou hast done this, thou shalt go at the head of them down into the valley which is northward. And 2 and 1, and it came to pass that Jared and his brother and their families, there we go. I'm supposed to change now. And it came to pass that they did travel in the wilderness and did build barges. So they had lots of practice crossing many waters to get to where they get. Now, this next one is Ether 2.13. This is the one you want to mark down. And now I proceed with my record, for behold, it came to pass that the Lord did bring Jared and his brethren forth even to that great sea which divideth the lands. Now, let's think for a minute. Think of our... Think of the world. First, we had an earth full of what? All water. And then we had one primordial mound. The primordial mound, where all the mound idea comes from, rise up out of the water. And then at some point, in the days of Pele, we're told in Genesis, what happens? That primordial mound gets torn in half, so to speak. Well, what happens to that big void? Water comes spewing in. So... Which ocean divides the land, the Pacific or the Atlantic? Atlantic. Atlantic. It's pretty easy. Atlantic divide. That means the Jaredites crossed on the Atlantic Ocean, not the Pacific. All right? Let's go on. So, seashore-wise, I'm working on this, and I'm not going to show you this much tonight. There's a culture in England, and they're called the Beakers, the Beaker culture. And I'll just mention their name once in a while. But the Beaker people, for me right now, is my target for the Jaredites actually being in England and leaving from the south shores of England, coming to America. So just hang on to that. No big deal. Now, what's cool is that early on, I was reading a lot of books on Atlantis, and I come across this one here, that the Egyptians said that the sea which divided the lands, to them, they called the False Sea. And rightly so, Yes. Rightly so. They call it the false sea. And so they understood what was going on. And then I got this guy, from this Frenchman. Who speaks French? You want to say his name? Le Plongeon. That's, that's good. The Egyptians themselves claimed that their ancestors were strangers who in very remote ages settled on the banks of the Nile, bringing there with them the civilization of their mother country, the art of writing and a polished language, that they had come from the direction of the setting sun. What direction is that? East or west? west? Thank you. And they were of the most ancient of men. So let's take a peek. Okay. West has to be home. And of course, there's always a chance out there that this may be a reality. I'm not going to say it's not. It could be. However, 
for them to be preserved and have everything they had, we know for a fact a lot of it had to come from North America because of what? Adam and Eve, Adam and Amon, the whole deal. We know it, this had to be part of that, whatever was going on. So that was pretty neat. And then, of course, you've got to remember on the Pearl Grey Price, we've got Egypt being the first discovered by a woman, daughter of Ham, Hamenic. And then this woman discovered the land that was underwater. Afterward, her son was in it, whose name was Ham, from Ham Spring, that race which preserved the curse in the land. Pharaoh, the eldest son of Egyptus, was the daughter of Ham, etc., etc. So there's a lot of connection here. Now, I was thinking to myself, and this really, this was bizarre. Uh, it was probably about June or July, and I was thinking to myself, you know, before I go out and present this, I need to have another source about this because this is too incredible about, you know, just having the Book of Mormon source coming from the East. Now, the Egyptians is one from the French guy, but I felt I need to have another one. And lo and behold, in my mailbox comes this. Anybody get Smithsonian in here besides me? Oh, shame on you guys. <laughs> anyway, the September issue was all about the kingdom of Cush. You know, if we knew as much about Cush as we did about the Egyptians, you would really be surprised how cool these black pharaohs were. Cush is the root of the black African civilizations. Nubia gave black people their own place at the table, and that's absolutely true. This is a tomb in Egypt, the tomb of king, I can't pronounce his name, circa 650 B.C., in El Kuru, the site of royal burials during Egypt's 25th dynasty, when Cush conquered Egypt and initiated the reign of the black pharaohs. No one talks about the black pharaohs, but they ruled for a long time. They were a real power. And then in the magazine itself, I'm going to pull out of there what these two uh, little quotes gave us. Right here. It was this place where the sun is born from the west bank, typically associated with sunset and death that the ancient Egyptians believed was the source of creation. Again, that is what? North America? Okay. Or Atlantis or a part thereof, whatever you want to do. But this, this is awesome. Good old Smithsonian. Defeating a coalition of Egyptian princes. This guy, I, whatever his name is, established Egypt 25th dynasty, whose kings are commonly known as the Black Pharaohs. And then this is another little tidbit right at the end. Look at this one. Think of your pearl of great price. In some religious traditions, Cush was linked to the biblical Cush, son of Ham, grandson of Noah, whose descendants inhabited the northeast of Africa. This, this, wow, this is awesome. This is, this is my backup. This is my next source. Not a problem. These guys understood what was out to the west. There was another land out there, and they knew it. I was talking with Adrian the other night, and I said, just imagine... Imagine Noah sitting there, and you know he lived to be a great age. He probably had four or five, six generations of grandkids, right, sitting at his feet. And one of them says, hey, Grandpa, tell us about where you came from. Tell us about the West. Oh, man, there's copper there. You can just pick it up. It's on the ground. Big trees, fresh water, lakes. It goes on and on and on, telling about where he came from. There's okay, elephants. Lots of elephants. Big, three kinds of elephants. <laughs> okay. So anyway, that's number four. All right. Any thoughts? Whoops. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask about uh, getting into the Egypt side stuff. What's your view on the uh, origin time frame of the pyramids? <sighs> Glad you asked. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to say just a couple of things, and I'm not going to expound any more on that. I'll tell you right now, you're going to find out the Great Pyramid was built by Enoch. That's what you're going to find if you dig deep enough. And his son Methuselah built the Sphinx. And the Sphinx never had a head of a person. It was originally a lion. And that's, what I'm going to, that's all I'm going to say. That is correct. Who was it that built the face-off? The French. You mean the nose? Yeah. Turks use it for target practice. <laughs> Turkey. The Ottoman Empire at that period. They, who converted it from the lion's head to... Oh, e Egyptus' people, early on. E Egyptus. But originally it was the lion's head. The lion's head. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, I don't want to say more than that. That's, that's another story. Okay, here we go. The Sutton story. This is really cool. Um, let's see. Yeah. This was given to me by one of my subscribers 
who just happened to be a member of the church. And when he saw it, he thought of me right away. And I mention this because this is always key. Helaman 610, Mulek's in the land north, Lehi's in the land south, and they won't see each other for 400 years. Very important. Because they've got to stay apart all that time. That's why when I showed that earlier map, that small thousand square mile area, it's just too little. They would have bumped into each other much sooner than they did. So uh, here's a little map. Lehi coming into Florida. Florida is the oldest Hopewell. Mulek is coming into the north, sailed into the upper uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. Now, and I use this from Dr. Sorensen. Um, what I liked about this, the other fellow that was there today, he mentioned this, that the Mulekites had sailed across from the, on the Atlantic. And that comes from Dr. Sorensen. And uh, this is about the only thing that him and I agree with. <laughs> uh, you know who he is. I mean, he's the leader of Farms. Farms is gone now, but he's still kind of around. But anyway, anyway, this is a, uh, yeah, I totally agree with this 100% because when this happened, the Israelites sailed with the Phoenicians to go get their raw materials. If you go into uh, uh, Kings and Chronicles, you'll see all that information about how they worked together as, as ships, as sailors, uh, going places. So, for Mulek and his company to leave and get away from Babylon, they would have had to have a Phoenician crew. Of that I'm convinced. And the Phoenician crew could also take them to the mystery land across because the Phoenicians have been visiting North America since about 100 BC, very early. And we got proof to back that up. That's not a problem. So let's go on. So the Mulekites land in the north, and here's why this is important because. They call that land bountiful. It bordered upon the land of desolation. And the real key thing is at the bottom, it's the place of their first landing. Now, if it was their only landing, would it be necessary to say first? No. This implies they're going to land, they're going to maybe stay for a while, and they're going to pick up, and they're going to go somewhere else and have a second landing, which I believe they did. However, here's the neat part. This is the part that came my way from the King family. Now, it's really small. I will read this. This is out of a diary. A woman by the name of Dills, who was a Sutton when she was a girl, after inquiring who we were and where we were going, stated that she never had seen but one Mormon, and he passed by without her getting to hear him speak. Yet she believed that there had been this land had been inhabited by an intelligent people. She said her father was a stonecutter and lived on the Little Miami River in Ohio when she was a girl. One day, when he was quarrying stone, he found in a bed of rock all the bones of a man's body. He fetched them home and put them under his bed. Now, stop right there. <laughs> he, hey, honey, look what I found today. Can, can he sleep with us? <laughs> under the bed. I, I, I can't help this guy, okay? Doesn't he know to put him in the closet? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> On the following... On the following morning, he told his family that the man to whom the bones belonged had come to his side of his bed. The man told him his age and that he belonged to a people that were scattered from the Tower of Babel when the Lord confounded the language and they were brought to this land. Here they became a numerous people. Then they began to have contentions among them, and so in those days the Lord raised up a prophet who prophesied that if they did not cease their fighting, that he only would be left of all the people in the land, and that it did prove so that they were all slain except himself and the other leader. And he finally came over him and tarried until another people came and found him, and he lived with them nine moons and died, and they buried him there where Mr. Sutton found his bones. This testimony came about 15 or 20 years before the Book of Mormon came forth. Now, first of all, this is considered a secondary source. Now, I tell you right now, the boys at Book of Mormon Central, they're not even going to talk to me when I put this out. But I don't care. I'm going to put it out so everybody can see it. Because technically the Zelf Mount incident with all the guys' diaries, there's about you know, 10 incidents on diaries. Well, that's all secondary. And they even refuse a lot of that at the Zelf Mount, the Zelf Mount incident. So let's just recap, because there's so much here. If M Miss Dills had never conversed with a Mormon, her father told the bone story when she was young. A spirit visits her father where the bones are under his bed. The spirit tells the father his age, but we're not revealed that. Spirit is from Babylon, where the Lord changed languages. His people were brought here by the Lord and were numerous. 
Contentions were great among the people and needed to stop. Lord raised up a prophet to warn them to stop. He and the other leaders are all that would be left at the end, and he would live to see another people who would replace him. After nine moons, he would receive a burial by the new arrivals, and the new people buried him where Miss Dell's father found him. This happened 15 or 20 years before Book of Mormon was printed. Now, if you accept this secondary source, then you can accept this, that the Mulekites indeed entered North America via the St. Lawrence because to find him where he was, they could not come up the Mississippi River. No way, no how. Mississippi, Alabama, Alabama is not the land north in my book. <laughs> Coriantumr was found not far from New York Camorra, supporting what? One hill. Staying nine moons and burying Coriantumr on the Little Miami River would make it part of the land bountiful next to the land desolation. Area around Lake Erie and Lake Ontario would be the land north with waters of Ripley Ancombe. Let's take a look. Now, in all of Ohio, we don't find any mounds north of where it says Fort Ancient. There's no mounds. If, can you see the little teeny lines there streaking along? Can you see the lines? They're very subtle. Can you see those lines back there? I point them out. Those are shorelines. Those are shorelines. When the Jaredites sailed into here, half Ohio was underwater. Okay? And they're staring out. Lake Erie and Lake Ontario have no form. They're all touching. And they're probably, my guess, they're probably touching Lake Huron. So when he said the water's to exceed all, he wasn't kidding. It was an inland sea, without any doubt. Okay? Now... Oh, yes. Is that conclusion borne out by geologists? Oh, yes, it is. And paleogeologists? That is correct. Because the, the Great Black Swamp, which is that green area up there, that still existed. That was in Book of Mormon times, and that still existed uh, when, when uh, the Europeans first landed, and the men from Indiana and Ohio and Illinois took the, the Great Black Swamp out, that dark green area. That extends all the way down to Fort Wayne, Indiana, to the left. That's how far down it comes down. And in that green area were three of North America's nastiest serpents. <laughs> now, what's the big deal about that? Because if we had the rest of the map, Lake Michigan's over here, and below Lake Michigan was the Great Marsh. The Great Marsh and the Great Black Swamp left a 50-mile gap. There's your pass into the land north. That's the passageway. And the serpents are there. And then as I talked to the table earlier, when Hagoth leaves Zarahemla, he goes up into Lake Michigan because he sets sail north. He can't go east and west because the lake is like this. You know, he's going to bounce like a ping pong ball. So he goes north. But at the Great Black Swamp and at the Great Marsh was a huge tamarack forest, straight as candles, 50, 60, 80 feet high trees. Those trees were still there. They were taken down by our Europeans, and that entire lumber trade went to England to build sailing vessels in the 1800s. And I call that Hagos Lumber Mill. Right there. Okay? So what were the three servants? Oh, man. Water moxin was one. I'm trying to remember. Um, uh, Cottonmouth was another. Yeah, uh, there was some type of rattler, but they were there. They were they were so bad the Native Americans would not go into the uh, Great Black Swamp. Whoops! I didn't mean that to take off. I'm not touching anything here. Well, hello, come back. Um, I can't get my. Uh, cur oh, there it is. There it is. Hold on. You can just go backward right here with the arrow. Okay. That one's forward. It's back. Yeah. There. Okay. Everything is there. All right. I wanted just to point out a couple of things here. Um, you notice down at the very bottom, the Portsmouth Works. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. You see, you know where they are. And then, of course, Corey Antimer, he's on that little teeny blue line. That, that is the, uh, that's, that's the little Miami, that little blue streak right there. And then uh, the Miamisburg Mound, that's Adena. Little Miami River, of course, that, those are all Adena Mounds there. Uh, the ones right here are also all Adena Mounds. And then Newark is Adena. And then way over at Marietta also. And it's all Adena stuff. So it's just, uh, I mean, it's just tremendous. So let's go ahead and go on. Number five. Oh, question. So uh, the Sutton story, was it actually 
Recorded on paper 15 to 20 yeah, guess who's got her diary? The Mormon Church in Salt Lake. They've got the diary. It's on file. You can go down and look at it. And we get we get, we got another one too. It's coming up. Hold on. What he's asking is, was it a contemporary account or was it recorded later in the diary? Do we know? Have any idea? Um, her diary was written by her later on. It wasn't written the day it happened. Okay. She wrote it herself at a later date. So but even as she died, she, didn't, she, she, she never ever met a Mormon and talked to him. That was her testimony. She never met anybody in the church. That's what made it awesome. Okay. This one here was really a surprise. I know all of you have seen this probably. Kinderhook plates, 1843. They found six of these um, <clears throat> around an Adena uh, mound that they dug up. And the guy was uh, extremely large. B.H. Uh, Roberts talks about it. Now, the critics of the, of the tablets, they, they claim that Joseph Smith did not translate the six little tablets. Well, that is correct. He did only translate a small portion because Wiley, the guy that owned them, when he came to Joseph's house, he allowed Joseph to examine them for one hour. And then he left. So Joseph didn't, couldn't look at them any longer than just an hour. And then, of course, here's the guy. They found a skeleton about six feet from the surface of the earth, which must have stood, must have stood nine feet high. The plates were found on the breast of the skeleton and were covered on both sides with ancient characters. I have translated a portion of them. They find they contain the history of the person with whom they were found. And here's the, here's the real hook. He was a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. So what's that guy doing in Illinois? I mean, this, this, is, I mean, this, is, this is tough to swallow when I first read this. I'm trying to think, how in the world did this happen? Okay. Now, Parley P. Pratt, who was with Joseph as a scribe on many, many times, we all know this, Parley wrote something that was quite unusual. Six plates having the appearance of brass. They have been dug out by a mound of a gentleman in Pike County. They are small and filled with engravings in the Egyptian language, and they contain the genealogy of one of the ancient Jaredites back to him. What? What? They contain the ancient Jaredites back then. Well, what do you think of that? Do you think Parley would just make that up? I, I personally believe that Parley heard that fall from the lips of Joseph Smith, that this nine-foot guy was a Jaredite. So here's our Pharaoh connection. Here's our Egyptian connection. Here's our Jaredite possible connection. And he talks about it. Why couldn't Joseph step out at this time and talk about a Jaredite, because a descendant of Ham, that makes him what color? What's going on in America? Abolition. What's Joseph Smith involved in? Running for President of the United States, and he's going to tell the world there's black guys buried in the mounds? Not going to do it. Bad, bad move. Bad move. They're not ready to receive that. He would have been done if he would have brought that up. But Parley told it the way he saw it. And I believe Parley heard that from Joseph. Now, that's just my understanding of the time. And then we have here <clears throat> William Clayton. He backs up everything in Joseph's journal that Joseph did indeed translate a portion of the plates, not the whole six, but just a portion. He backs that up. And this guy here, whoops, went the wrong way, sorry. And this guy, William Clayton. Here we go. And then this here is George D. Smith. The Kendrick Statement was approved by Brigham Young. Ed Asmunds notes that Brigham Young saw the plates while present at Joseph's house and included a sketch of one of the plates he saw at Joseph's house in his diary. While we are unable to verify this claim directly as the diary has not been published, the diary still does exist. It's held by the Brigham family, and uh, they won't put it out public. So, again, that's another lead but uh, we can't have it until they decide to put it out, okay? All right, thoughts or comments? What do you think about the Jaredite comment? What do you think? What's, what's, your, what's your take? You think Parley made it up, or did he hear it from Joseph? What do you think? Was he a fanciful man? Parley? Yeah. Oh, he was very serious. He yeah. loved Joseph. Yeah. He loved Joseph. It would be an odd thing to just make up. I, I really think that he heard it from Joseph. So I really see a motive for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's not out selling the information. 
you know, anything like that. Or I'm going to sink Profit's uh, presidential campaign. So can we assume then that the Jaredites were black? Well, <clears throat> I think we can say they probably were, but you need to get my Jaredite DVD downstairs? Mm -hmm. We did. Okay. <laughs> You'll find out. Was there anyone other than Joseph who was trying to translate Egyptian stuff, or was that, was that only Egyptian? No, uh, no one saw those things. He only had them for an hour, and then they all went back. Now, there is one more thing I failed to tell you. At this time in America, there was no brass available. These plates were made out of brass. Every clock being made for about five years in America at this time, they used hardwood from the east. Britain controlled the brass market, and they had a tiff with America on trade, and we could not get brass in this country. Had they had brass, they would have paid dearly to have it just to use for a hoax, for a good joke. It would have cost them a lot of money. I mean, more than they should have spent. Another point, just want to let you know, okay? The brass is a serious question. Okay, now here's another one. This is really good. Elizabeth's Diary. This, this is rocking. <laughs> here's the three players. Jacob Baum, Elizabeth Baum, and the prophet. This is in Nauvoo. It's about six miles out of town. If we were there, I could drive you right to the spot. And uh, I'm going after the landowner pretty quick. And you'll see why in a minute. Okay, here's her diary. I'm not going to read this little thing, but the part that we're going to talk about, I'm going to blow it up so you can see it. And there it is. One day, about 1844, the pigs were feeding in the woods and rooted up an evidently ancient mound, unearthing some bones, which Father discovered was a human skeleton of immense proportions. Among the bones was a huge skull. He drove the pigs out of the field brought the skull to the house to show the family. He held it up over his own face. It was so large, it frightened mother and us children terribly. <laughs> yeah, mean, mean dad. He took it and went back, and in excavating further, he found, now the, keep the notes, 12 giant bodies buried in the form of a wheel with heads to the center forming the hub. Okay, you got that? Spokes of a wheel, all laying out. Hang on, that's very important. While he was thus engaged, the prophet Joseph Smith stopped by on horseback, inquiring what father was about. He soon discovered the sides of the skeletons and remarked, Jacob, those were Jaredites. Cover them up. Let them rest. Fence them in so nothing can disturb them further. Well, what do you think? Are we going to accept this? Guess where this diary is? Church Archives, Salt Lake City. Uh, of what? Are there any other records like in the of like skeletons? Yeah, outside of Christmas Greens skeletons that large. You mean about large skeletons? Yeah. Oh yeah, large. honey, I got, I got lots. Yeah. I got lots. Are there other examples of this wheel like burial? I, I'm not I'm not done yet. Okay. <laughs> We're looking for reasons. I, I'm not I'm not done yet. Okay. So let's just highlight. Skeleton of immense proportions, huge skull taken to the house, skull so large it frightened the family, 12 skeletons buried like the spokes in a wheel, all heads to the center like a hub. Between seven and eight feet tall, Prophet Joseph arrives, identifies the skeletons as Jaredites, cover them up, let them rest. Now, I put this together so you could see what it must have looked like. Hancock County, there they are, spokes of a wheel. Are we all in agreement? Now I'm going to show you a burial that we find in Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Are you ready? Go. It's the same. Except three people got their heads between their legs. Why? I don't know. <laughs> My point is, this has been identified as an Adena burial by our non-LDS archaeologists. We got our adjournments. We got them. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to scream it from the housetops. She's got a theory. Oh, fire. Would the skull between the legs indicate that they've been beheaded? Well, they're, obviously they've been beheaded, but um, maybe, it shows that, maybe it shows that they're women and they birth children. I don't know. 
No. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. What do you think of that? Are you ready to accept the Adena as Jaredites? I am. I am. Do you suppose there's 12 to, to civilize a clock? Or is there some other... Zodiac? There we go. I don't know. That's just what they did. This is a very good Adena burial. Very typical. Yeah. Oh. No, it's just it's just dirt. It's, it's, yeah, it's just a pile of dirt that they they worked around. So would these be sacrificial burials? Uh, no, no, no. These these have been laid out very nicely. Like a holy man? Would they be a family? What, like were they so being the same size of ish? You know, ish. So we're not looking at children and they're they're all adults, adult males. Yeah. Were they all going to die at the same time, or would they just be? They uh, they did they were used to pile them in big piles with minimal dirt. So I mean, that's the battle mounds. Yeah. This this is great care here. Uh, we just don't know why they did this. It was a quorum of high priest stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> okay, all right. Um, here's just a one a one piecer. I got this. I was at a. Uh, a 400-acre compound, all fenced in, um, a polygamous group, great people, uh, southwest out of Independence, Missouri. I've been there twice. And uh, a little gal came up and gave this to me, and I have treasured it ever since. The Potawatomi Oral History. This was gathered by Milton R. Hunter. We know who Hunter is. Some do, some don't. Milton was a 70 in the church. He wrote a lot of books on Central Mesoamerica. And near his uh, death, he was beginning to switch. He was beginning to swing uh, one hill. But here's a, uh, this is from Chief Shupshi of Potawatomi, recorded in 1954. These migrations all came to America from the east. It is evident that the Indian's tradition agrees with the Book of Mormon in several important respects. The people who came here were led by the Lord, according to Chief Shupshi, and also according to the Nephite record. He said, and I quote, that one group of colonists came to America about 4,000 years ago in boats like tortoise shells. A dish unto a dish. The Mulekites, the Jaredites, are mixed together, or I should say the Adena. They're, they're, they've run together. First of all, I'm going to be able to show you that all of the Jaredites did not die at 600 B.C. In the a land of the many waters, perhaps they were all dead. I don't have a problem with that. But being here 1,700 years, these guys had to be in California, Mexico, maybe even Alaska. I don't know where they went. But they wouldn't stay around Lake Erie and Lake Ontario for 1,700 years. It, it just, it's just not logical. Okay? And the archaeological record will back me up on this and show that these guys mixed with the Ojibwa Indians. And uh, I'm putting all this together into one big happy story. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> De Haas and Cheney. Um, I really respect both these guys because uh, they told it like it is. Uh, De Haas worked for the Smithsonian, and because he did that, he lost his job. Cheney worked for the state, and uh, he kept his job. That's the difference. Here's what happened. De Haas was hired and worked, by under, worked under John Wesley Powell. He was his right-hand man. He was going to go do everything in Ohio and the, the whole western uh, part of the country. Southern Ohio, Mound Builder area, at, he was assigned to Portsmouth, that, remember that place at the bottom, made observations as to mound construction, and concluded that the Celtic hinges, now a hinge, that's that circle, one way in, one way out. Okay? That's a hinge. All right? <clears throat> yeah. Celtic hinges and causeways from southern England were noticeable as a comparison to Ohio. Dated the dig site to 990 B.C. to 1500 B.C. These are the beakers. These are the beakers you find in southern England. That's what they're talking about. He doesn't say beaker. But that's who they are. 
sent in a report to J.W. Powell and was immediately fired while still working in the field. It took him four weeks to get a reply. He wrote an approximately 100-page paper defending his work with the mound builders in the Ohio Valley. It was never published by the Smithsonian and is somewhere in its deep recession of hidden material. I got a copy. I'm working on it right now. I sure am. Now, here's what got him in trouble. The top is Portsmouth, Ohio. The bottom is Avebury, England. Do we see a parallel? No, if it's coincidental. Somebody throw him out. What do you think? He called it like it is. He said, this isn't Hopewell. There's a Dina folk. They built this. 1,990 B.C. And the skeletal remains he was pulling out were seven and eight footers. Seven and eight footers. Can you explain what we're looking at? I don't know what those pictures are. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> this here is a, a huge earth berm. I mean, like, large. Okay. Very, very large. Ceremonial set on the side, an interior ditch, and this is a berm and a walkway that connects it all the way to a bigger circle with two more circles inside that are hinges and another one going out. And then there's a huge hinge right here. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. And then there's a burial mound right in the dead center of that. Down here at Avebury, here's the same thing. Circle, circle, spot inside, two. This one here is, is posted. This one here, the posts are long gone because these are stones, and you can see this, the similar thing. And then here, instead of that hinge, they put up a big conical mound right here. Okay? Southern England, Beaker people, Beaker. The Beaker people also brought something very special to the British Isles. They don't know who they are. They came from the east. They were traveling, came from the east, and they brought metalworking. Now, what was, you've got to go back to Genesis, Ham's people got a gift from God. I'll give you a hint. Any idea what that is? Metallurgy. What's that? Metallurgy. 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 The Hamites were metal experts. And we have guys coming from the east bringing metal to southern England. And they don't even know where they came from. They just showed up. And they also disappeared around 2000 B.C., Oh, my. How about that? Another parallel. Beakers. I love my beakers. <laughs> now, here's Cheney. Cheney worked for the state. He made the same conclusion that de Haas did because of the hinge. He recognized this as coming from southern England. Cheney did in his pages. Let's take a peek. Cheney says... The tumulus, represented upon plate three as peculiar construction, appears to belong to a class of mounds different from any others embraced in this exploration. The work of construction has the ditch on the inside, the wall on the outside of the mound center, as do the druid barrels of England. The mound, from the peculiar form of its construction, as well as from the character of its contents, has much resemblance to the barrels of the earliest Celtic origin in the old world. British archaeologists say this is a perfect description of the ancient sepulchral burrows in the British Isles. I give you Professor Cheney. Now, what's cool about this, at this same time, look at the dates. This is when the copper mines were extremely active. Whose timeline does this match? Jaredites. I mean, top to bottom. It's all there. Do you know they have almost no burials of people in the Upper Peninsula and northern Wisconsin that are the miners? But they have a few. Those few, when they have excavated them, I don't know if you know this or not, but black people have a different tibia than white people and Indians, and they have a special little difference on their humerus. The bones that came out of Upper Peninsula all belong to the black race. Wow. What they have done with that, they have buried it. To show you their ignorance, they couldn't understand how African slaves could be buried up here in the ancient copper culture. 
You see, they're just, they're not even close. Not even close. Yeah, I'll fire. Yeah, so maybe make this, this point too, because it's really interesting as far as metallurgy goes. I mean, it's, it's a pretty uh, complicated science. It's not just, you know, it's not easy. And, and so you're talking about these mines and, and this metallurgy they had. Well, a real glaring problem with the, uh, you know, Miss America model is the fact that the Mayan, who they, you know, great, you know, glamour that are the Nevites, um, they don't even get to the, a level of metallurgy that's even decent until 700 A.D. That's right. Did y'all hear that? Yeah. 700 A.D. for Central America, metallurgy. So to just think that, that they're trying to claim that that's where their sites are, when we have these mines at 1850 B.C., 2450 B.C., I mean, that's a difference of 3,100 years. Yeah, that's right. And it's all in North America. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. It's, I know, it's incredible. They, they, they can't, they, well, they can't even argue. Now, just so quickly, here's just some beaker artifacts and North American artifacts. What's that there? Oh, you're showing up from your phone. Never mind, it's gone. <laughs> it showed up here. Maybe it didn't show up there. That's all right. <clears throat> my texts coming in over there? Yeah, don't write any private messages. Yeah. <laughs> Bad. Bad. Okay, so look at the axes here. They're, they're virtually the same. And uh, copper armbands. Uh, North America to British Isles, again, same. Remind oh. me why, or remind us why they call, they're called beaker people. Is it because beaker... It's the pottery. Oh, it's the the pottery. pottery. The pottery. Explain that. Yeah. That's why they, they call them beaker. It's the pottery. And I, see, I don't, I'm, I'm not <laughs> showing everything here. Now, this one here is one of my favorites. Okay. These things are worn right here on your chest. Okay. Now, I pulled out this one from the British Isles because it's, it's the best example. I'm going to show you the one I have from Trump County, Ohio. Ready? How's that? I mean, it's, you know, there's not a lot of difference there except for the actual knobs on the end. And what were these used for? Like we, we don't know. They meant something. It, it meant something. Could be civil. Could be military. Uh, Maybe the, the, the guys that were single wore these till they got married. I don't know. You know, whatever. <laughs> who, who knows? They were the colors they wore after they got married. Right? Uh, okay. <laughs> Some of the movies I've seen show Roman uh, leadership with. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. And, and, yeah, there's a name for them. Uh, actually, the Goths, uh, the, the Goths in France wore the same thing around, around there for a long time. But otherwise, they were buck naked when they went and fought the Romans. They just had this one thing on their chest. Yeah, crazy people, crazy people. <laughs> So then here again, just so you can see, here's Ohio, Kentucky, Ohio, and then there's England up and down the, the right side. See? The barrels, they're all the same. They're just the same. And then here's one. Amber, I need you to consider this. <clears throat> you recognize the hinge. Now, in the old world, the hinge w represented the womb of the female. Fertility rights, birthing, was highly regarded and we have these pregnant women, but th these were of, of great worth to our earliest, earliest of people from the time of uh, Noah after the flood. Uh, this is the earth mother goddess, and these are the hinges that they represent, and I'm gonna show you a couple of hinges real quick here in America. <clears throat> that's Anderson, that's the drawing, that's what you see there to the inside. These are sacred centers. And this is my favorite in Indiana. The archaeologists in Indiana are the only ones who will admit that the hinges were made by the Adena people, or our Jaredites, but they were remodeled by the Hopewell because they had the same astrological settings that they use, same calendar fixes. So here's the problem, you see. We come over, we excavate this mound, and we find wood, but the wood that we find left in there was placed there by the Hopewell when they remodeled on top of the Adena. So we get a Hopewell date, but the construction is done by Adena. It's Jaredite. 1,700 years, the Jaredites had to leave some kind of form of city, and we have nothing. It's all Hopewell. And I'm saying something's wrong in this picture, and I'm going to show you something else. Just hold on. I got more. Here's a hinge. I showed this a little bit today. I made a comment about the elephants. Again, I think the, the Adena here, our Jaredites, they really appreciated 
the American pachyderms, and I mean, they're just honoring the guy. They put an effigy inside a hinge. Okay, now, here's the good one. This is done by archaeologists. Uh, this is it's his doctor, um, let's see, Dr. Baby. It's not Baby. I gotta think for a minute. I'll catch his name in a minute. Anyway, they went to the Hopeton earthwork. They purged it. Now, the thing has been completely leveled by farming, but they're gonna do a dig. They're gonna cut through the trenches, what's left, because they can see it from the air with infrared. And they cut through. Now, here is the Hopewell timeline. They will tell you in Ohio there are no Hopewell before 100 BC. And that rings true because they're still in Iowa. They're still in Zarahemla. They haven't started to move east yet. And that's total agreement with the Book of Mormon. So they're saying 100 BC, Hopewell begin to show up and they are building these earthworks. Well, they kept digging deeper. And lo and behold, uh oh, now they got a 200 BC date. They said, well, maybe we made a mistake on the first one. We, we, can, we can slough 100 years off, right? Well, they kept digging. 375 B.C. Can't slough that off, guys. They're caught. They now realize the Hopewell are not the first builders of the geometric earthworks. It's the Adena. It's our Jaredites. Okay? These are their cities that the Hopewell have sat and squatted on top of. Okay? A pretty sight to a Adena guy at 2000 B.C. was just as good looking to a Hopewell guy in 500 B.C. Now I want to live here and they build our stuff on top. And then we come along and we build our stuff on top. What is Cincinnati on top of? Cincinnati, Ohio. It's on top of the Shawnee Nation. Their capital called Prophetstown of all things. Totally squatted on top of it. You can't find a thing today. So we do the same thing. Here's the geometric earthworks. And Nephite, Jaredite, Jaredite. Okay? All right. Questions or comments? Just to be fair. Oh, back there. Um, a couple slides back, you were showing uh, a slide with like six different pictures of, of mounds. And you said, for the mother of the right side, it's from England. But one of them was labeled Ukraine. Is that a significant? Yeah. You know, it just, well, it's just showing us all the way out there to the east. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're there all the way across to southern England. Okay? Just going to comment, Wade, to, to be fair, that idea of building on top of older locations, that happens all over the world. All over the world. And all the time archaeologists are surprised yep. when they happen to dig down deeper and yeah. find that there was something else. There. Or they decide to conveniently stop. This is it. Yeah. Yeah. Who? Oh, I grew up in St. Louis, just outside of where the Yeah. Do those play any part in any of this? Well, they're, they're post-Book of Mormon. They're 900 A.D. Okay. However, in the northeast corner of Cahokia, the mound itself, there is a stone structure built by the Adena. They know it's there, but they can't go after it because if they strike out that corner to open it up, they get a good rainstorm, they're going to have massive erosion, and they're going to hurt the whole mound. And that's the quandary. Otherwise, they would have done it. They found it about 10 years ago. So they know it's there. Okay. Because a lot of those mounds, like this, they're ceremonial and they're already aligned. Finding those moon, those lunar alignments. That's right. Really oh yeah, I'm not blaming. They. Years to figure it out, so they get they're like, oh, the, the work's done. Let's just use it as work ceremony and stuff because it's so complicated to redo it. Why, why, why? why well, reinvent why reinvent the mousetrap? It's already there, and I, I agree with you. Yeah. There are places in Scripture where the Lord says the remnant will take over the cities that are empty. Okay. The Gentiles. All right. In the end, the yep. Gentiles. Continuing on the pattern. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, ready for this one. This one will be a lot of fun. Um, any, were any of you at Rod's conference before we shut down when I showed the Maya? One hand. Who the Maya are? Ooh, this, will be, this will be fun. Okay. Dr. Michael Coe, Yale University. He is the expert in Maya for all of North America. And he makes fun of Book of Mormon archaeologists every day. <laughs> this here is Palenque. It's one of the favorites. And uh, yeah, let's go on. The buildings in Palenque were constructed in Atalum times, beginning about AD 600. The earliest dated buildings in Palenque are over two centuries after the final destruction recounted in the Book of Mormon. 
Michael D. Cole, professor of anthropology at Yale University, commented on the difficulty of dating the ruins of Palenque to Book of Mormon time period. How is one to reconcile this dating, Nephites from 600 BC to AD 385, with the flat statement, we'll come back to this, of Joseph Smith himself, that Palenque was a Nephite city? This Maya center was built after 600 AD, according to all modern scholarship, 215 years after the Nephites had been wiped from the surface of the earth. I can only sympathize with the Mormon scholar who has to work that one out. <laughs> now, what's the deal about Joseph Smith? He didn't say it. <laughs> okay, the deal is, when Joseph was the editor of the Times and Seasons. When the Times and Seasons was printed and was ready to go out to the street, that last page where his signature was, it was you know, a built-in, like a stamp signature, he would sign his own name. Joseph's name does not show up on the paper that claims this statement. The statement is there, but Joseph was in hiding on one of the islands in the Mississippi. We have tracked that down. I should say Jonathan Neville tracked it down. And he did a good job on it, identifying where Joseph was. He was in hiding. But they put this out anyway because his brother, Winchester, uh, uh, William Smith, and then the other guy, Winchester, they were in cahoots and they, they were pushing already pushing for looking at the big buildings in south of the Rio Grande. So that's the story on that. All right. And then we've got, of course, this here. Uh, Sorensen puts this out. If, if you had the, uh, the unsigned in 84, at the Maya and Nephi are the same, and that really ruffled my feathers. Um, so I said, who are the Maya? And when I got into this, this was, this was a shock for me. I did not know this. This was all new. Hindus in Central America. Hang on, it's going to get nasty. 1849, the United States, Central America, Ephraim Squire wrote, a proper examination of these monuments would disclose the fact that in their interior as well as their exterior form and obvious purposes, these buildings, temples in Palenque, Palenque, correspond with great exactness to those of Hindustan, India. The eminent scholar Miles Poindexter, a former ambassador of the United States to Mexico, in his two-volume 1930s treatise said, the area Incas called the Maya civilization unquestionably Hindu. There are so many cultural similarities. Whoops, where'd that go? Hello, bingo. <clears throat> there are so many cultural similarities between the Hindu and the Maya civilizations that it makes it very easy to point out towards a common relation. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Every 10 years or every decade, a major work has been done on the Hindu and the Maya connection. And our academics in the anthropology department at BYU has allowed this to go on and letting us think that the Maya are Nephites, Jews, Hebrews. And I'm telling you, that, that really sets bad in my craw. <laughs> this is public information. This is not a secret. This is not a, they, they have to know this stuff. That means it's been deliberately covered, in, in my estimation. Here's another one. The Maya of Yucatan offered animal sacrifices to the gods in the same way as done in North India, at the same seasons and determined by the same stars. Maya scorpion stars were the same as the constellation Scorpio on Hindu charts. At the Maya site of Ushmal in Yucatan, some phallic structures were discovered which were later removed by the authorities in the late 19th century. In Hindu culture, phallic structures are worshipped in the form of Shiva, lingams representing Lord Shiva. That's in Hindu America, and I got the book downstairs if you want to pick it up. It's wow. a fantastic read. I did a reprint on it because it's oh, in the public domain. In America? Yes. No. Yes. Oh. I'm here to tell you, boys. Look at this. Look at this. Mesoamerica, Egypt, Indonesia, India. And down in front of each pyramid, they always have a square building, like an anti-building, and it's facing the cardinal directions, and each side has three doorways, always. These guys all went to the same engineering school, I'm here to tell you. Okay? There's no mistake. Check this out. Island of Bali, Mesoamerica, the big serpent coming down the staircase. Well, here's the staircase. Okay, yes. When you were showing the hewn stone thing earlier, mm -hmm. um, I've been to Bali 
you a few years ago, and that's what it made me think of was like all the things, all the carvings in that. Area. Right. Exactly. Look at this is this is a good one. Anchor Wat Tikal. Not bad, huh? Chichen Itza and Cambodia. That's the one. That's it. The one you see in all the church paintings. The one they've been to. But there's one in Mexico too. Yeah, this is it. It's just I, maybe it's just mislabeled. I, uh, it, okay, then. it's still in the wrong place. <laughs> so Alma's Book of Mormon Tours and the in Cancun area are full of themselves? <laughs> the first time I met two adult missionaries that had been down there, uh, I, it was University of Minnesota. I was given a, a deal over there to the, to the seminary, the the college class, whatever you call that. And uh, when I finished, uh, these two people, came, two adults, they came up, and they just said, wow, I said, I've never seen this stuff before. How come I haven't seen it? How, where has it been? I said, well, it's, it's out here. It's just everywhere. You have to look, you know. And he said, well, he said, I believe it. And he said, you know, we were down there before we came on our mission, and we got off the bus at one location, and we stepped out, and our guide said, welcome to Zarahemla. And we went and saw this pyramid and saw that pyramid. We got back on the bus, drove to the next stop, stepped out of our bus. Guide, a new guide shows up. Welcome to Zarahemla. And he said, this went on four times. Welcome to Zarahemla. So I said, well, you're lucky it wasn't welcome to Camorra because that doesn't end. There's a whole bunch of Camorras. But anyway, what I was going to tell you, in, in India, on Hindu country, these guys were sailing the ocean deep. Four and three hundred BC, with two and three masted sh sailing ships. Now they were way ahead of everybody in their time. I mean, way ahead. They're called the Kushanas. Big trade network. A lot of bucks brought back into India. And guess who delivered the Hindu missionaries to North America? The Kushanas. Hindu missionaries, North America. Look at this. Notice the forehead, notice the nose. Are these four or five all the same? Pretty much, right? They all look Mayan. And look at the ears. The one on the right bottom, that's in Mexico. The others, excuse me, that's in uh, uh, Bora Bador. The others are, are Mexico Mayan. The point is, it's, it's the same. They're just, it's just incredible. And then we find out. The archaeologists right now are into a big tiff, and, and the, the division is who brought corn where. Did the corn come, the corn come west to east or east to west? And the, the one team says the Hindus brought corn to America, and the other team says no, corn came from America to, you know, Hindus. But that's that's a big fight right now, which I'm not involved in. I just want to show you what's going on, because they got corn in all these same images. It, it's a big fight, but let, let them duke it out. Now look at this one here. This is pretty cool. Java. Assyria and Ecuador. So what's going on here? Who's sailing around the ocean blue? It's not Columbus, right? No. Now, get away from this. This is the other connection, is the architecture. This is called corbeling. The Maya have been doing corbeling long before the Book of Mormon, but they did it in tombs, underground. Nothing above ground, underground. And then eventually, they started coming out of the ground around 400 AD and building all their buildings. Angkor Wat, same time. Of course, Pyramid of Giza is a little bit older, but again, it's corbeling, the same. And then I'll show you when Mulek and uh, Nephi leave Jerusalem with Lehi, of course. They are looking at the true arch. The true arch. Now, let's check this out. In masonry construction, the true arch is formed with a continuous line of wedge-shaped stones while a corbel arch is formed by a series of overlapping stones. Compared with a true arch, a corbel arch is less stable and less efficient at converting tensile force into compressive force. My argument, why would Lehi, Nephi, Mulek, why would they go backwards and build a corbel arch when they've just come from a place that has the better arch? Why would they go backwards? I don't think they would. Another reason to stay away. So anyway, 
this is where I published my Hindu America stuff, and I got it down there on a DVD, just so you know. And there's a whole lot more. Um, remember the Red Book Scare? And all the Chinese youth went nuts, started killing all the professors and learned people in China. You remember that? It was the late 60s, early 70s? Yeah. The Red, the Red Cultural Revolution. Yeah, Cultural Revolution, okay. What did the Dalai Lama have to do? Did he stay in Tibet? He left. Where did he go? America. Black River Falls, Wisconsin. He came and lived with the Ho-Chunk Indians because his missionaries had been there before. The Ho-Chunk know the Dalai Lama. Yeah, that's in my DVD. So, now, I saved the best for last. I have two more. Do you guys want more? Yeah. You sure? All right. I don't want to have you lose your sleep now. Oh, I wish I'd go home. I'm sorry. Anyway, okay. Searching for Zarahemla, east bank of the Mississippi River. This is what's called the bean by the locals. And uh, that very little point down there, if I can get to it, this, um, just so you get acclimated. This is Nauvoo. Nauvoo is right here. City of Nauvoo is right here. And the temple site that I'm going to talk about is right here. Right straight across the water. Okay? I had the first thing I wanted to check out is how strong was the Hopewell presence in the area because I didn't know. And I found out Hopewell was plenty, plenty represented. Look at the fish hatchery mounds, 200 BC, Turkey River, 500 BC, uh, Catfish Creek, 500 BC, Toolsboro, 200, Malchow, 400, and then got my spot down there at the bottom. Let's see, this would be, uh, yeah, okay. So I found out that the Hopewell. By the way, these dates here, if they stand exactly the way they are, these are all Mulekite burials, not, not Nephi. Nephi is not here yet. Mosiah hasn't made the trip yet from the land of Nephi. Hasn't, hasn't arrived yet. This is Mulekites. Okay, very important. All right. Ohio Hopewell, these are their artifacts. I want to show the little doll especially. These are the effigy pipes. In Iowa, we find effigy pipes just like this, and we also find two more that have never been found anywhere else in the Midwest. They happen to be elephant effigy pipes. Only the Hopewell made effigy pipes. Okay? And this is just a little side note. At Joseph's store, right on that wall, they decided in 19, about 1975 or 6, they had to dig a new power line to the log cabin that goes off uh, that direction. In doing that, when they cut a trench, they had one of those uh, little, I can't remember what they call them, the little diggers. They, they went on about, they, like a ditch witch. Ditch witch, thank you, that's it. Anyway, as soon as they started digging, bone and pottery just started flying everywhere. Because starting at right here, everything all the way to the Pioneer House is a Hopewell burial ground. Wow. Burials are everywhere. And this is what came out to prove it, this pipe. And the pipe, unfortunately, is in the hands of the community of Christ, so I don't know if I'll ever see it again, but uh, I got a good picture of it right there. And now, here is the drawing, and I'm going to go one more. There. The drawing on the left, that's from um, Missouri, just, just over from Nauvoo on the Missouri side, and you can see the doll is exactly the same. Look at the arms, the knees are crossed, everything is the same except for the headgear. Now my purpose in showing this is that this doll comes from the very edge of West Virginia. The one from Ohio, excuse me, I mean from uh, Iowa is sitting right there by, by uh, um, Keokuk. So we're showing the two extreme ends of the Hopewell territory, showing they are the same. And also, uh, that, along that same notion, the two largest Hopewell forts, uh, one is in Missouri, uh, it's called the, um, the Van Meter State Park, and the other one is in West Virginia, and it makes them different is that both of them have double wall and double trench all the way around, double. But yet that exists nowhere else. It's almost as they said, here's our eastern border and here's our western border. So I don't know why there's nothing in between that's built that way, but just on the edges. And that's where we find the dolls, just on the edges. Very, very unusual. Uh, I'm not sure what it stands for. So, last year, I ran around in the summer, and I got permission from 
enough farmers for us to look at 11,000 acres when the crops were off in November. We labeled the fields and we came back with German technology to scan. We're scanning for fire pits, charcoal, because we can get dates off of charcoal. That's what we're after. Uh, you see the number one up on top? That is the temple area. We did around that and, and we worked our way down into Montrose because the, the land is going up elevation and we know these people like high ground. So we figured there's probably a lot of stuff around Montrose, the city of Montrose. This is the, what the rig looks like. It can go 10 miles an hour. We can do a lot of acres in a day. We trade out, we got three guys, we trade off for different drivers. And uh, this thing goes down about 20 feet and picks up all kinds of data. And I'll explain that to you in a minute. This is what a data sheet looks like. And these are targets it gives us back. Some we can identify they're not worth going after, others are. Now these targets, we can come back and find them even like now next year because this is Mike Stallman. We have a thing called a, a garn. He's holding that little blue box, that's the garn. Now above him is an antenna. And check this out, Iowa is the only state in the whole USA that has an, a cloud over its entire state, a grid. And so we tap into that grid with this blue deal and this antenna, and we are connected to that grid. And then when we shoot on the ground with our radar, that connects to the grid, and we can go away and come back six months later with that little blue gizmo, punch in the coordinates, and we can get to within three inches of our mark on the field. That's what's going on. It's awesome. It's very expensive, but it's awesome. But why is there the cloud there? Why? Um, they did it for farming. So I don't, I don't know how they use it. I don't care. I'm just glad we got it. <laughs> but that's what it looks like. And so when we did our cores last November, all, all manually, um, I had to proceed and do all the, the post holes. I took out the first 24 inches so they wouldn't have to go down that much because we went down 48 inches approximately, 40, 48. And so I ran around ahead of the, the core guys and I chunked the holes and they come along and then they do the, the twisting and we take the cores out. It's hard work, very hard work. Well, let me tell you, it's hard work. I found out I got muscles I haven't used for years. <laughs> but anyway, we did all that. Here's a, here's a piece of iron we found down on the ground. And then here is what we're after. This is our charcoal. Now, at 40 to 48 inches, we didn't know what we'd find. We're just looking. And what we found out was, if you look, you can see the, the numbers there, 1,001, 942, and then got a 268. We hit mostly Mississippian timeline at that 40, 48 inch zone. So that told us we have to go at least down to five feet, maybe five and a half. But to do that, we gotta use power equipment. We can't, we can't go that deep, twisting. However, notice the clam. We hit a clam bake at 2175, which worked out to 225 BC clam bake for mulekites. <laughs> Got one good hit. That was awesome. And this is what the clam shell looks like under a microscope. There it is. Now they told us that uh, the clam shells, that sometimes you can't use clam shells for dating because they take on the carbon from the lime, limestone if they're in a the river. However, the majority of the clams that you find are in freshwater little creeks. Clams don't like fast-moving water, and they don't like deep water. They're usually up all the narrow creeks. And then, this is a surface finds that I got from local, um, you know, art artifact hunters. And there's the dates. And the last one we couldn't date. Again, on the surface, we're finding that little less than uh, the Mississippian, but it's not good enough. We've got to find, find more. Now, this was a real learning curve for us. Black sand pottery is Hopewell pottery. Everybody knows that. We found this, we recognized it, we were happy, we were excited. We, th we knew we had a good solid Hopewell hip. And then we tested it and it came back at 1000 AD. Okay, what happened? We called the State Archaeologists of Iowa because the oldest black sand pottery is found in Iowa. And from there it goes all the way to Ohio, getting, you know, younger. So he tells us, he said, well, you guys fell into a very normal pitfall. 
He said, somebody back here found your piece of pottery, and maybe it was whole, maybe it's just a portion, but when they took it and they threw it into their fire, and he says the problem is it's thermal luminescence, and when you do that, the heat resets the date in the pottery. He said, you have Hopewell pottery, but the date's been ruined. That's all. So he says, don't, don't despair. He said, we, we run into that all the time. He said, you got Hopewell pottery. So mark your spot and go back there and, you know, hit around it so we, we know where we have to go. So that's pretty cool. Well, it, it's, it's dating uh, young, you know, not as old as it should be because it's been refired. Oh, okay, so it's it younger. That's correct. So here we have, we've got, uh, this is our black sand pottery, and this is it. It begins in Lee County, Iowa, 350 B.C. all the way to 400 A.D. There's that 400 A.D. date that it ends, and it goes eastward across the heartland of America. And then again, so here's our two successful deals we got, the clamshell, and we got the black sand pottery. Unfortunately, we don't have the right date, but we know what it is, and we know, you know, we learned something from that. And then we got, of course, we're going to go back and do a really small dig uh, this summer uh, on the temple lot right there.